be human is denied every day to hundreds of millions of people. Dans ce temple des Nations Unies, nous sommes les gardiens d'un idéal. Nous sommes les gardiens d'une conscience. La lourde responsabilité et l'immense honneur qui sont les nôtres doivent nous conduire à donner la priorité au désarmement dans la paix. Chaque génération, sans doute, se croit vouée à refaire le monde. La mienne sait pourtant qu'elle ne le refera pas. Mais sa tâche est peut-être plus grande. Elle consiste à empêcher que le monde se défasse. Se défasse. I have really the pleasure and the honor to introduce uh, Bruno Zima. Uh, Bruno Zima is a judge of the Iran United States Claim Tribunal at the Hague and is an emeritus justice of the International Court of Justice, as already recalled, for the period 2003-2012. Uh, in this period, he served as a sitting judge uh, in many uh, very important decisions of the court. And I like to remember uh, the jurisdictional immunities of the state, Germany versus Italy, because he's also in a, in a beautiful conference about this judgment and its consequences at the domestic level that we had the opportunity to meet in Villa Vigoni on the Lake of Como in 2017. He had, as already mentioned, a wide experience at the international level, at the UN level, before the ICJ has been a member of the International Law Commission of the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. He has an incredible experience as an arbitrator in numerous interstate foreign investment, international commercial sport law cases. But he also has a long and distinguished career as an academic. Uh, he has been uh, a loyal professor of the Munich Law School, the Munich University, where he, uh, where he has uh, been professor for 30 years, and is now professor at the University of Michigan as Beit Lea Global Professor of Law. He is the author of more than 150 publications. Among these, uh, let me just remember the commentary on the Charter of the UN, that is really a seminal reference for all international lawyers. So I think that there are few people that can have the expertise, the stature, knowledge of Professor Bruno Zima in international law. And we are incredibly happy to have him with us today uh, to discuss the International Court of Justice as a driver of human rights. Bruno, you have the floor and thanks really a lot for being with us today. Thanks to Valentina for having invited me uh, to this uh, masterclass. You tried several times, there was always something in the way, but finally it happened. And I'm very grateful to you for your invitation. Let me also thank Professor Panousis for the very friendly uh, words he, he spoke about me. Um, I'll speak for, I was told that I would have about an hour, an hour 10 to an hour 10, an hour 20 minutes. This is a long time, but I hope I'll keep you interested. I know how problematic it is. To, to listen to a speaker for such a long time. Um, I will um, I'll first introduce some features of the International Court of Justice that I consider to be relevant for the treatment of human rights by, by this court. And I'm going to move to um, a very short uh, tour d'horizon of the development of human rights jurisprudence by the court. I'll, unfortunately, I have to be very brief. Then I will uh, turn to the court's use of, uh, let's say, very, let's say, modern features of international law, like that you could describe from, uh, with a phrase which is very dear to my heart, from bilateralism, a move towards community interest that has also kind of, it is also forming and informing the work of the court in more recent years. Um, and, and then conclude with a few observations. Um, first, let me, let me just explain how I got to this uh, topic, the ICJ and human rights. Um, uh, Valentina has mentioned that I started out as an academic, and of course I still am an academic to some degree, like this morning, uh, speaking in front of you. Um, and I always had an interest in human rights, 
as it should be. But my interest was always uh, focused on the how do human rights fit into the system of traditional international law. So it was always, let's say, I, I was never, I have to confess that I was really never an activist in the human rights area, maybe except of uh, donating a little money here and there. But I remember that my first wife, she always said, Bruno, you are a human rights lawyer uh, with a credit card, by which she meant if you ever go somewhere, for, let's say to kind of develop or observe human rights, it could only be to places where they accept a good American Express or a credit card that is not to, to places like, well, I'm not going to mention names. So I had written a few pieces on how do you, Germany could enforce human rights obligations in Eastern European countries. I wrote long before Germany was reunited. Uh, and that uh, some people in the, in, the, in the German foreign office found that interesting, probably for the wrong reasons, because they probably thought, finally we come across somebody we can call a human rights lawyer. But what he, what he writes is very, let's say, down to earth um, and not kind of up there in the blue. And so they invited me to become a member of a newly established uh, UN Human Rights Committee in 1987, which was the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Of course, the, the wallflowers in the, uh, among international human rights, nobody had great expectations. And so they said, all right, let's get Sima there. He can actually not, not cause much damage there. Um, so I, I joined this committee and I have to say this was an interesting experience because uh, more and more I felt like I am to be the, I feel like the house lawyer among these people. They were, they, they had a culture background, they were economists, there were a number of people from Latin America and other places where you really didn't know what they precisely what they did do. I mean, uh, they, of course, nowadays, everybody calls himself or herself a professor, you know that. So very strange. And so I found, I, I found myself, um, let's say, playing the role of an, uh, uh, the lawyer among the human rights people um, and kind of a, a bit of a watchdog over these rather loose canons in this human rights committee. Mm -hmm. From the Economic and Social Rights Committee, I changed to the International Law Commission in 1996, starting in 1997. And it was interesting because there my role turned around 180 degrees. Whereas among the human rights, let's say, experts, I felt like a lawyer. Uh, among the lawyers in the International Law Commission, I felt like a human rightist. And droit de l'homiste in the sense of Alain Pillet's famous expression. To, and, and, and I found out my role was to somehow, uh, let's say, uh, protect, protect human rights against some ideas these people like uh, foreign office lawyers, uh, former judges from a number of countries uh, against, um, let's say, like uh, I remember at the time, a very famous international lawyer was the British member, Professor Jan Brownlee, and Jan Brownlee had the idea that the, the, the International Law Commission should finally turn to human rights. And I did everything I could to prevent that from happening. I think until now, the International Law Commission has not really put a great focus on human rights, which I think is a good thing. And I'm glad, I would be glad to go into that in, a, in the discussion period. So when I was uh, elected to the ICJ in the early 20, uh, in 2022, 2002, uh, I, I went to the court and of course my interest continued and now let's see what does the ICJ do about human rights. Um, so that is, that is the story of how I ended up writing about it and uh, really focusing my, one of my research interests on that topic. Let me start with uh, pointing to a few institutional features of the ICJ, which are important to be uh, to keep in mind. And the first feature, I've, I have a little headline here, reads glory and misery, glory and misery, universal reach subjected to consent. And what do I mean by that? Now, if you look at modern international courts or like uh, also European European courts, you see that 
there is a statute and people join the court by ratifying, acceding to the statute. And by doing so, they subject themselves to the competences of the court. And once the statute is enforced, etc., states can go and they can make claims. They can sue other states or uh, uh, organizations. So, but the statute itself establishes not just the organization, the, 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 the actor, but also establishes the competences. And it doesn't need any, any further agreement among states, for instance, to go to that institution. With the ICJ, it's different. And that has to do with the fact that it is soon going to be 100 years old. And of course, I don't have the time to take you back into that period. Um, but um, what the ICJ let's say, offers is there is a statute. Members of the United Nations are automatically also members of the statute. By, they recognize the existence of the ICJ. They have to pay their share for the work of the ICJ, but that's more or less it. Which means if you, it doesn't mean the establishment of the court, the statute doesn't mean that you can go to the court and just sue another country. For that, it always takes uh, the consent of the state at some, maybe, maybe made 50 years ago. In some instances, you look for the consent of a state you want to sue, which might have been given in 1920 and somehow be transferred to the ICJ statute after 1945. So all the ICJ does is, or, or the, the statute does is it establishes procedures on how to bring about jurisdiction, but it does not establish specific competences. There is no jurisdiction ratione materie in concrete cases yet. So this is what I call the misery, you know, uh, consent, consent. Um, how about the glory? How about the grandeur? Well, on the, on the, there is another side of the medal, and this other side is if jurisdiction is secured, there is no limitation of substantive international law to be brought before the court. You can bring a claim which has to do with the, you're not happy with how the boundary be to, to, towards your neighbor runs, you're not happy about uh, the treatment of your ships in a foreign port or in, a, in an EEZ, but you can also bring a human rights claim. And the ICJ is the only international court in the world today with potentially, let me, let me emphasize this term, potentially universal jurisdiction. And in that sense, I think uh, it is certainly a, and I quote from the name of your masterclass, a global actor for peace. But again, it is totally on, dependent on the consent given by the parties to dispute. And in that sense, the peacemaking function that, um, is, of course, limited. And, and of course, let me just mention that, that you would have to ask, okay, now if that all depends on consent, how about the willingness, how about the readiness of states to bring interna international human rights cases before the court? You might have heard about other human rights treaties establishing human rights treaty bodies or the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. And before these institutions, you can also, claims can also be brought by one state against another state. But what, what kind of comes out is that at the United Nations level, not a single interstate case has been brought, for instance, before the Human Rights Committee. Uh, and, and when you look at Strasbourg, you would say that the great majority of the few, relatively few, interstate cases brought to Strasbourg are what I would call in German, uh, well, I'm, I'm not going to speak German, don't be afraid, but the German word would be Nebenkriegsschauplatz, which means there is some political dispute, there is maybe even an, a military conflict going on between the two countries before the court. And um, one party considers going to court just a, it would be the, um, I think the Americans even have a word for it. Uh, uh, so they, you use the law also as a means of waging a war against another country. And we are going to get across a couple of, uh, of cases before the ICJ. All right. So second, the second um, institutional feature that I need to mention is that, of course, the most of the cases we look at are so-called contentious cases. 
The ICJ can do two different things. It can settle contentious cases between states and it can render advisory opinions. But the greatest number, if you look at the, 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 the court's uh, website, you see that I would say nine out of 10 cases are contentious cases. And of course, a contentious case, um, in a contentious case, the, um, for instance, the human rights claim would be in what, I don't know how good you are in classics, but there's this, uh, Ren Valentini would probably help, have to help me, the, the bed, bed of Procrustes, the Procrustean bed. You know, Procrustes was a host in, um, in, in old Greece, and, uh, but his beds were too short for, let's say, some of the travelers. And so what the guy did in order to fit these tourists into his bed was just to cut their feet or their legs off. And that's, that's, that leads to the expression, there is a, a bed of Procrustes here. And of course, the bed of Procrustes is also, let's say, present here, because any human rights claim, for instance, will have to be handled by the court strictly within the limits, the limits with which the claimant puts the case before the court. And so maybe features that you would regard as very, uh, uh, very, uh, let's say, important in a human rights context will simply not be an issue before the court. Non-state actors, non-state actors are hardly involved in ICJ proceedings. So you have, uh, the, there were the debates here and there from time to time about amicus, uh, accepting amicus curiae, uh, uh, let's say, uh, submissions. But until now, this is not, not even this is the case. Against, again, a hundred years old, you know, and a hundred years old, nobody would, would have known what you mean by amicus curiae. So cases are framed by states, by states' own interests. And if cases have to do with human beings, in most instances, these human beings will be somehow attached to the state bringing a claim. There's the famous Mavromatis case, um, um, that is states protect their own nationals, but why, why, why should they protect or bring a case to the ICJ, which has to do with the protection of foreign nationals? That's a question which we're going to encounter again. Um, another thing is, the ICJ, when you look at what can the ICJ do uh, on a case, you read, I think it's in Article 36, it, you read that, okay, this, the, the, the court can decide on violations of international law. Uh, so the court decides on violations and it, the, the court's uh, world on the law on violations and the law on remedies, if violations have happened, is very old fashioned. It is really a, you could call a, a, a a tort law image. So if there's a violation, what do you do? Well, okay, you have to engage in reparation and reparation will consist of uh, whatever, uh, compensation in money or restitution in integrum, et cetera, et cetera. So this is probably something familiar to lawyers even a thousand years ago almost. So this is very, very much behind, for instance, what the Inter-American Court of Human Rights does when, when it uh, comes across a violation of international law. So going far beyond what the ICJ has done until now. Well, I mean, if a human rights problem, if a question is brought before the court in, a, in, the, in the framework of an advisory a proceeding, then of course the, the court has much more, has much more liberty because the court knows that what it says is not legally binding, but of course will have a, uh, a lot of weight because the court, after all, is the judicial, supreme judicial organ of the United Nations family. Um, and so some of the most interesting uh, statements, sayings about uh, international human rights, you find in advisory opinions. All right. I think in a, in a masterclass like yours, it is not important to say the ICJ that I'm talking about is not the International Criminal Court. Um, I remember when I was a judge, you got about one to two letters or emails per week, which says, could you look, could you see how, prof how Mr. Uh, Milosevic feels in, in prison at your court? So the ICJ has nothing to do with international criminal law. There you have La Cour Internationale de, what is it? The, 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 well, I, I better give up my French. So the uh, International Criminal Court 
a mile to the northeast of what I'm speaking about. Another uh, institutional feature, the composition of the bench. Um, if you look at the 15 judges now, or if I look at, the, at my 15 colleagues at my time at the court, you can see there's, you cannot really say that there's a lot of uh, human rights no, uh, expertise on the court. You have one, you have one member of the ICJ who really, who is deep in uh, international human rights law, and that would be the Brazilian judge, Mr. Cantado Trindade. Uh, but uh, I hope I'm not too impolite if I say that when he writes, it is a good example of self-referential writing. So he turned, uh, okay, I'm not going to go farther into that uh, because there might be some Latin American uh, students in the audience. But um, I, 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 I don't consider him a very effective human rights lawyer uh, within the court, because if you want to have an, an, an impact and if you want to have an effect on what the court decides, you really have to engage in the, in the language, in the jargon, and in the, in the, in the, that, that, that the majority of court uses. Otherwise, you're simply not going to be instituted. So composition of the court, I think that's where the, the second part of the, the title of, the, uh, of your uh, masterclass came to my mention, the West and the rest, but in a very different sin, uh, sense for that, uh, than the sense that you are going to pursue. Because you could say that if you look at the composition of the court, you see that so-called Western countries and great powers are overrepresented vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. So um, I, I, don't, I don't want to go into numbers, but let me just indicate that there might be changes in that regard. There was a few years ago, there was, a, uh, there was an event which really shook the ICJ, namely uh, the British judge not being re-elected and the Indian judge taking the place of the, the British judge, let's say. So there might, what we might see in the future would be some kind of a changing, in, uh, changing of the composition of the court in favor of the, well, ce qui reste, le, the rest of the world. All right. Now, um, what were the expectations of the, uh, of the world vis-a-vis -vis the ICJ in 1945? It was decided to maintain the ICJ and to put the ICJ into the, 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 the structure of the United Nations with regard to Interstate cases, fine. That's what the permanent court always had done. With uh, expectations as to the ICJ with regard to human rights were, were modest. And my good friend, Philip Alston, once told me the following story. He said there was in 1947, you had the UN Commission on Human Rights, you know, the famous one with uh, Madame uh, Roosevelt. Uh, I think she might have been in the chair even. So the... Uh, working on the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. And there was the question before the Commission, should there be some kind of implementation or enforcement? And then the United Kingdom, interestingly, made the proposal uh, that you, we could invest the ICJ with the power to give advisory opinions on human rights. And these advisory opinions could then submitted, be submitted for action to the General Assembly of the United Nations. And the Australian delegate just noticed in his report, um, subsequent discussion demolished this view, demolished this view. Now, if a diplomat speaks of a view being demolished, that means that there was probably a bit <laughs> uh, laughter. And uh, you know the, what the ICJ, um, as we say in German, machen wir dort nicht den Bock zum Gärtner. You know, I don't know what the equivalent in French would be. Maybe somebody can help out later. Um, now, the international human rights law that the court applies is, of course, a treaty law. You have a, a, a growing number of um, international human rights conventions. And besides that, people say there is also a customary international law of human rights. Um, and I personally have a bit of a problem with that, uh, with that view, but that's another uh, topic. Um, but what the court considers is that these treaties and the customary law on human rights are fully integrated within international law, within the system. 
So the court has never viewed human rights law as a, what some people call a self-contained regimes. That is a body of law, which is more or less detached from the rest of the law, has its own sanctions, exclusive sanctions. No, no, the ICJs, no, no, human rights law are within the, the body of general international law, and they're not decoupled from that rest. Um, the court further has no hesitation to resort to or apply human rights treaties, which have their own judicial or other, uh, uh, let's say, bodies of supervision, like the European Convention on Human Rights or International Human Rights Conventions. So uh, we'll come across or uh, a case, Diallo, in which the court for the first time referred to the European Convention on Human Rights on, on uh, I think, on provisions on detainment of people, uh, um, referred to the European Convention, uh, referred to the uh, practice of the European Commission on Human Rights and also the UN Human Rights Committee uh, practice of application of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. So the court applies this law. It doesn't sh just stay away and say, this is only the business of the committee. This is only the business of the Strasbourg Court. The substantive law of these uh, conventions can also has also a place in the jurisprudence of the ICJ. But you can also say that the, that the ICJ, in doing so, uh, defers to the case law of these specific treaty bodies. And because that, of course, would be um, a danger uh, if the human rights, uh, sorry, if the ICJ developed the jurisprudence on human rights, um, and in doing so would pay no attention or would not keep intact the, the jurisprudence of the specific regional human rights treaty bodies that you find in these treaties. Um, for instance, there is, a, there is one case in the, in, the Diallo, in the Diallo case already mentioned, in, I think decided in 2009, which has to do with a guy being uh, detained in the, uh, in the Congo, um, uh, where the court spelled out a view on, found that detention um, in, in breach of the law, but two of the judges, uh, Judge Greenwood and Judge Keith, uh, wrote a uh, declaration, which is actually a dissent, saying that uh, the court had applied certain provisions of the international covenant uh, in a way which did not correspond to the how the Human Rights Committee defined this right. And they said that the ICJ should follow the jurisprudence of these treaty bodies. All right, uh, the last thing here in the context is that the court defines human rights and distinguishes human rights from lesser individual rights. That's, I think that is a novelty which the court has developed or spelled out for the first time in the Lagrand case. This is a case very dear to my heart. It was a case that Germany brought against the United States and where the court says, well, we have to deal with this uh, um, alleged right to consular um, assistance. Germany claims that this right has recently developed into a human right square brackets I still consider I still consider the um, I still re, uh, remember this very fondly and because I was it was my task on a on an afternoon from three o'clock onwards to plead this precise point before the ICJ this consular this uh, article 36 paragraph one of the Vienna Convention on consular relations, has now developed into a human rights, referring to uh, the um, a, um, a, a dictum of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. And um, when I pleaded that at three o'clock, I remember that a couple of cases just slump on their side like this. Among them of the most liberal and left-wing uh, 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 judge on the court at the time, uh, a fellow from um, Algeria. And then we had a coffee break, and I remember a German diplomat coming to me and saying, Sima, don't believe, don't believe that they were just tired, maybe from a lunch with a glass of red wine. No, no, by kind of slumping or falling asleep, they wanted to express their lack of, uh, um, let's say, uh, agreement with what you pleaded. 
And I can only say from my own experience with the sittings in the afternoon after having something like a formal lunch, that it is not an expression of uh, lack of recognition. It's just a, an expression that you have uh, a, a number of mainly elderly white men sitting up there and fighting to keep uh, fighting to keep awake. Uh, all right. Last word on on, on this uh, the. Um, fact finding i think what you also have to keep in mind is the 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 capacity of the international court to engage in fact finding that is to establish facts or to examine facts put before it by states are extremely limited extremely limited the court has no um, the court could of course call for uh, witnesses the court could uh, ask parties to cl clarify one or the other a factual point but very little of that is happening in the practice of the court. There is a slight change in that regard. Maybe you have heard about the whaling case of a few years ago, uh, where some uh, cross-examination of witnesses was done, but actually very little of that happens. And that, of course, is, is, is a very actually problematic feature in a human rights context. And, and the, the case which brought this out very, very clearly was the so-called genocide case, brought by Bosnia-Herzegovina against uh, Serbia in, uh, at the, in, in, in the early 80s, um, in, at, the, in, at the outset of this Yugoslavian civil war or whatever you had there. Um, and the entire the facts on which the court rested its judgment uh, on, on, on the matter of genocide was more or less a, based on what the uh, international uh, criminal court for former Yugoslavia had uh, had uh, assembled and secured and uh, found uh, as as uh, sufficient proof um, also in the Hague in, in in their own cases against persons accused of genocide before this court. So there was hard, there was no and there could not be much. Uh, of uh, individual uh, fact finding. Okay, so this is just to give you a little, how should I say, the atmosphere um, or circumstances that make the courts dealing with human rights uh, partly problematic or just give it a special, let's say, flavor. This, the, sec the, uh, the, the next point I would like to deal with would be the uh, the development of human rights jurisprudence. Unfortunately, I have to be very brief. You know, when I when I pre, uh, when I prepared this, uh, I have two and a half pages of notes in front of me, and um, I think on the basis of these two and a half pages, I could easily fill a seminar for uh, taking about uh, for about five lectures. Especially, of course, when you start dealing with individual cases that you consider to be relevant in that context. I really have to kind of uh, condense together. Um, and I hope that the, the term master in the designation of this class and a word that Valentina told me before we started, namely that there are students that know what you have written about this topic. So I just trust that I can be brief here. I must be brief. But what you, what you, what you can observe in that regard is the following. Uh, the, the development of the court's decisions or, or the court's statements on human rights was a development which was gradual, very gradual over time, and in step with the development of international human rights by the United Nations in general. The court is part of the United Nations, let's say, International human rights law, aside from the regional human rights developments, like in, in Europe, for instance, or in, in Latin America, uh, took, uh, took decades. And the court's jurisprudence kind of follows or is in step, more or less in step, with the widening and thickening of international human rights jurisprudence from an in incidental role to more important to a more important part of uh, judgments. Incidental roles like in Corfu Channel uh, caught near to my heart because uh, one of my great hobbies is warships. You might have noticed, I don't know where you see it, there is a, 
there's a, a worship model right in the back here among my books. Um, and Corfu Channel, first case before the court, dealt with activities of the British Navy following World War II. It had to do with mines, and I would love to go on about that. But what is relevant here is only that in the middle of this very hard military talking, the court referred to elementary considerations of humanity as one of the reasons or one of the basement, the basics or the, the foundations of states' uh, obligations to inform other states uh, that their shipping would be in danger because in the territorial sea of us, there, st there are still mines from World War II around. So this was a, what I call incidental. Already in the first judgment of the ICJ, Corfu Channel, there is a mentioning of human rights. But I mean, it doesn't really go very, very far. Um, or then you have uh, the famous Barcelona traction case, Barcelona traction, a case which has to do with, uh, let's say, the protection of the rights of shareholders. Um, so it is really public international law on commercial relations, uh, status of uh, corporations in international law and that kind of stuff. And there suddenly you have that paragraph which says, to be dis we have to distinguish between the, this, this commercial things and the, uh, obligations which run between two specific states and obligations, uh, erga omnes, and I'll turn to them a little later. Um, so, and, and then the rest of the judgment is again commercial law stuff. But in there you have that, and you just wonder, well, how did that, you know, the geologists sometimes find just in the middle of some landscape, they find a rock, and this rock is then called, uh, this is an, an erratic, erratic, that is an, it comes, it, it, it has come here by some kind of almost error. It doesn't belong in that landscape. And that's how, what the court said about Aragonus obligations in 1970 was really, didn't really fit into their judgment, but of course it was there for a good reason. That I mean, incidental role, obita dicta, the court on human rights. Um, or the, the, the 1951 advisory opinion of the court on reservation, reservations made to the, the Genocide Convention. So uh, um, an advisory opinion, very important for the development of reservations to multilateral treaties, which was linked, which started in a human rights context, because the Eastern European countries that had just uh, be, uh, become communist or had gotten communist uh, governments, decided, yes, of course, we are all against uh, genocide. Um, and so we are going to ratify, but we are not going to ratify the, the jurisdiction of the ICJ provided in that. Con and we, we exclude that by reservations. And the United States, they, and, at, at that time, being the, the master of the United Nations, um, got some countries to uh, ask the ICJ for an advisory opinion on can reservations really be made to a treaty of that kind. And the court more or less spells out the modern law on reservations. It, human rights are the, let's say, the, the trigger to all of that. But it is, what the court then spells out is just goes far beyond human rights. It could be on a treaty on, on, on environmental law, on climate change, whatever, whatever. Then you have, uh, then you have, uh, then the, the, let's say, the readiness of the ICJ develops a little further. There are um, cases uh, where the court starts referring to substantive human rights obligations in, in different contexts, like nuclear weapons advisory opinion in the mid 1990s, uh, the court says, and one of the one of the uh, norms of, inter of universal international law, one of the obligations deriving from these norms is, of course, the international covenant on civil and political rights and the right to life. And just throwing nuclear uh, bombs at your enemy creates a problem in that regard. Nuclear weapons, the war opinion. In Congo, Uganda, a judgment on the, the war that had been raging and still, uh, let's say, in, in the northeast of the Congo, the court for the first time in the, the dispositif of the judgment mentions human rights. It says there were lots of violations committed there and one set of violations consists of violations of international humanitarian law committed by Ugandan uh, 
let's say, the, the non-state actors, um, etc., for which Uganda is responsible. Um, then the first really real human rights case, very interestingly, is a very atypical case. It's Diallo, the Diallo case, which was decided in 2009. And you just wonder, it is a case brought by Guinea before uh, the ICJ, and it has to do with the treatment that a, a national of Guinea, um, uh, Amadou Diallo, has experienced in the Congo as a businessman. So part of the case was his corporations were kind of, you know, almost, uh, uh, how should I say, uh, um, destroyed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But also the case also re uh, related to the personal treatment that he had been subjected to, like thrown into prison, thrown out of the country, things like that. And there the ICJ first kind of got rid of the commercial type, uh, let's say, uh, parts of the of the case. And then Diallo became a, a, a pure human rights case. Came out that said, Congo has violated um, obligations of international human rights law, one, two, three, et cetera, et cetera, uh, before returning to the good old Mavromatis type thinking and therefore, and therefore Congo owes a compensation to who? Ah, uh, not Diallo, but uh, the uh, Guinea. And actually, in, in 2012, the court decided that Guinea would get a certain, a very modest amount of US dollars as compensation for the treatment that its national had experienced. So, Diallo is a very interesting mix. First time that the court really deals with the human rights matter. Uh, but secondly, with regard to the remedies, the court falls back into the good old or bad old law on uh, on diplomatic protection of its own nationals. And when you look at the cases, I remember that people said this is a case that should really be brought to before an exit tribunal. It's uh, before an in, uh, this should be subject to investment arbitration. It has to do with the investment of Monsieur Diallo. And sometimes in investment cases, like in a number of cases that I currently deal with, the the treatment of the, the investor, like sitting in prison, etc., is part of these cases, and investment tribunals deal with that subject too. So why the ICJ? I don't know. I don't know. Of course, if you bring a case like that before the ICJ, this is a, 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 a guarantee that the courts will be well observed and maybe you have your chances of, uh, of winning uh, or of getting compensation are greater in that regard. Um, so uh, as I said, I could spend hours on that. Maybe, maybe those of you who have really prepared themselves or the people that know my writings I just refer that I've number, uh, written a number of uh, of uh, uh, papers in journals or in festschriften about that subject, where you could look up what for details that I have to say on these on these cases. Um, so what you see is a um, what I take at the headline here on my two paper pages from hesitation and restraint to fully engaged use. Of human rights, so the court over from nine from 1949 Corfu up to here has gradually increased its turn to its opening towards international human rights law, and uh, in very recent years we have had a number of cases that you can really regard as human rights cases proper, uh, fully grown. Um, with whatever outcome, I mean, uh, I, I turn to that towards the end of my uh, of this thing. Uh, maybe not with the outcome that uh, droit de l'humiste would would expect or hope for, but at least human rights treated fully. Germany versus Italy, Belgium versus Senegal, the Gambia versus Myanmar, etc. All right, uh, I look at the watch and I see time is really going fast, and so. Uh, I turn to the next slide. I don't spend more time here, but really I'll come back to the most important cases in, in, in what I'm going to say now. So my next point is um, the court's use of modernized or humanized international law. You see, there's a book by Professor uh, Theodore Miron, I think which is called The Humanization of International Law. It is a, a nice uh, catchword. 
on what I'm uh, what I'm really dealing uh, talking about here. Um, and what do I mean by this? That is, in recent years, the court has um, built its human rights jurisprudence on uh, a few developments in the in the doctrine and theory of international law in general, namely uh, the uh, concepts of jus cogens uh, and obligations erga omnis. Jus cogens and obligations erga omnis. Now, of course, you know what jus cogens is about, peremptory international law, treaties invalid if they, um, let's say, um, conflict with rules of jus cogens, and obligations erga omnis. Um, that is, uh, let me let me maybe say what the ICJ mentioned. But it's not really the first time in the jurisprudence of both international courts that the, the term erga omnis was used for the first time by the Permanent Court of International Justice, but in a, in a different context. It was used for the first time in the in a case which had to do with the right after World War One. The right of uh, ships to go through the uh, North Ostsee, uh, the Kaiser Wilhelm Channel, which is a canal which goes through uh, Schleswig-Holstein in the north of Germany. And if you if you don't want to go around Denmark and let's say uh, uh, go around these islands, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to go into the Baltic, you can use that canal, which ends up on the Baltic uh, port of Kiel. Um, and there was a there was a conflict on the what ships under what circumstances could use that canal, and the court came out and said that this uh, an obligation of Germany to allow ships to go through that canal. This obligation is erga omnes, which means it is uh, it is um, owed to all other countries, owed to all other countries. Now um, the, the 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 use of the term obligations erga omnes in the um, um, uh, Barcelona traction case went much further, of course, because what the court said there, there are important, there are important obligations under international law, fundamental obligations in human rights, prohibition of torture, um, um, prohibition of genocide. These are obligations. They don't run bilaterally between pairs of states. This is an obligation against the entire international community, the world of states as a whole, and every other state, and that is the that is really the element of erga omnis now, the new one. Every other state is entitled to uh, to uh, let's say has a has a right and an interest in the obser observance of that obligation. So it's not a matter for a um, let's say a, an, an immediate victim. Well, uh, of course, the use of force, the prohibition on use of force is an obligation erga omnis too. And of course, if a state is attacked, then that state is the victim of uh, erga omnis of obligation uh, violation. But other states can also come to the help of that state. Of course, now that's expressed in, in, in the rights to, uh, to self, uh, say collective self-defense and, uh, and alliances and the like. But in the human rights field, it's very new. Obligations are gone. This means a state violates human rights, maybe exclusively committed against its own nationals, which of course is an element in the great majority of human rights uh, violations. Just look at Myanmar, for instance. And every other state has a right that to see that this violation ceases. It's in the interest of every state that, that the violation has comes to an end. And of course, then questions will arise, like what can the third states, of course, they are not really third states anymore, what can they do against such a violation? Or in our instance, more specifically, can one court, uh, sorry, can one state go to the International Court of Justice and say, I bring a claim against state X, uh, because the state, butchers its own population, which has another religion, etc. So that is the, the context of obligations are on this in, in before the court. And that is what is of interest to me. Uh, and just to kind of summarize against, uh, 
the, the court is modernizing its jurisprudence in that regard, and the dogmatic theoretical foundations are the concept of use Kogans and obligations that are gone. And of course, you can say, uh, if, I if I use Kogan's norm, it's violated, that immediately leads to the uh, rights of other states to react. That is, obligations under peremptory rules of international law uh, are at the same time also obligations ergo omnes. Okay, let's see what the court does with that. And here I think there comes an interesting uh, relationship or connection between the work of the International Law Commission and the work of the court. And I, I consider myself very, uh, actually, um, very uh, lucky that I had a, a chance to be there in the inter as a member of the International Law Commission when this very part of international law was developed. I'm talking about uh, the work of the ILC in the field of uh, state responsibility. Um, so the court, the court had worked for a long, long time on state responsibility, but during my years at the ICJ, not, not the court, the commission, uh, and during my years at the ILC, this was brought to fruition. It was the so-called second reading on state responsibility and the final adoption of the articles on state responsibility that then went to the United Nations under the leadership, actually, in the commission of James, of James Crawford. Uh, so wh where does that where does that come out in the in the work of state responsibility? So the the, the articles contain a part on um, the implementation of state responsibility reactions to violations and the like. And the first chapter in that part is called uh, contains rules on the invocation of responsibility, invocation of responsibility that it, which state has a right to invoke a breach of international law by another state, invoke either to start a bilateral diplomatic, uh, let's say, uh, back and forth, or the question is, could that also be an invocation before the ICJ? And uh, in the work of the ILC, you find two articles in that regard, articles 42 and article 48. And article 42 says, a breach of international law can be invoked by a state which is violated, etc. That if you look at Article 42, it is a translation into the jargon of state responsibility of what you already find in the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties in Article 60 on breach. Just under what circumstances does a breach, i.e., violation, internationally wrongful act, uh, lead to what possible reactions of the state which is injured? So in Article 42, you have what can injured states do? Injured, a state is injured. A state is attacked, like um, um, uh, Ukraine when the Krim was uh, was occupied by the, by Russia. State is attacked, um, and then but the, so this is this is traditional law. Um, but then you have an Article 48. And Article 48 uh, is entitled um, Invocation of Responsibility by States Other Than Injured States, by States Other Than Injured States. And there uh, we are precisely in, in the neighborhood of our the, the ICJ cases to which I'm going to turn, which means under what circumstances can, let's say Austria, one of my two home countries, or Germany, under what circumstances could they go to the ICJ and bring a case against the state at the other side of the world for violations, for certain violations. And what the Article 48 says, yes, uh, in state responsibility can be invoked by states other than an injured states, and this state can claim compensation for the injury caused by those breaches. But of course, the compensation is not to be kind of uh, kept by the by the claimant state. It is. Uh, it is to go to the victims of that breach. This is possible, and uh, that this is possible in instances in which the rule that was breached is a rule which is not established for the, let's say, personal uh, gain or in the in the interest of a specific state, like in a trade agreement. But it, uh, the uh, this is established for in order to give teeth to to treaties and rules 
which which kind of uh, judicialize, uh, let's say, bring into law a, a common interest of states, a common interest, a community interest. And I think the prime example of uh, rules of international law which uh, fall into that category would be human rights treaties. Human rights treaties are not created for the benefit of Austria versus uh, Kazakhstan. Human rights treaties are, are created for in, the, in, in a common interest to see that specific values which have found expression in international law obligations, in treaty obligations, like a, a prohibition of torture, um, a prohibition of racial discrimination, all the human rights substantive obligations that you find in these treaties, they are, and they are to be protected in, in ways that are based on a common interest of states that these obligations are, 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 are ob observed. And then the question is, of course, so and, and so what? I mean, we, if the other state just, and there the International Law Commission had originally um, um, provided for a rule which says, well, in the case of very grave breaches of rules in the in the jargon of Alain Pili, uh, that is uh, norms and obligations, ce qui reste des crimes, that's how he calls them, says uh, le droit qui reste des crimes, the, what remained of the famous notion of international crimes of states. If, if these very, let's say, fundamental rights, uh, obligations are breached, states other than injured states can also engage in countermeasures. Countermeasures were, of course, not the armed countermeasures, but like economic sanctions, etc., etc. That's what the Commission kind of sent to New York in the in the summer of 19, uh, let me see, I, I don't, no, no, wait a minute, uh, uh, in, in the summer of 2000, and uh, I'm not going to explain, I don't have to explain how the International Law Commission works, so you have the Sixth Committee of the United Nations, then kind of commenting on the work of the IC and sending, uh, sending signals back to Geneva what the Commission should do, still do, or do differently. And what came back in uh, in 1980, sorry, in 2001, was very clear signals by important states like the United States, but also UK, etc. They said this goes too far. And so what we find in the final draft, the final work of the International Law Commission about invocation of um, responsibility by states other than injured states is that uh, they, you can, as a non-injured state, you invoke that breach, but if the breach is not healed, if the state, the violator state doesn't change its position, you cannot engage in countermeasures, you can only engage in, in means which are in, in, in uh, let's say, not against international law, like retortion or something like that. So that was the work of the International Law Commission. A great, a very, very, very important opening of state responsibility towards community interest. Very remarkable. And I think a great achievement of uh, James Crawford uh, and of the commission <laughs> at the time, really. Uh, because state responsibility used to be the most traditional, the most bilateralist, the mo uh, something really formed and following very, very classic civil law on torts, you could say tort law. And this was an opening from tort law to a, a more public law inspired system that an international community should be able to do something, not just a, an injured state. And of course, in case of human rights violations, you sometimes you don't have injured states. All the injuries done to uh, foreigners, to the Myanmar population. Uh, okay. So, so far, the International Law Commission. And this was used now and applied by the ICJ in a number of remarkable judgments. And the first of these, of these violations was, the first of these cases were a case brought uh, by Belgium against Senegal. Um, it had to do with uh, the, the Jad. Jad had been under the dictatorship of a, uh, uh, what is he? Issa Nabri. Ah, uh, uh, yes. yes, 
he was sitting in Senegal. Um, no, nothing happened to him. He, well, he lived quite comfortably there, even though he had he had committed crimes against humanity and atrocities, incredible atrocities. Tens of thousands of people had been killed uh, in the Jad in the 1980s. People had fled to all other to a number of other countries. Some of them had fled to Belgium. They became Belgian nationals. And then you have something in, in Belgium, like I think you also got them in France, actually, which is le juge d'instruction, which means you have probably young, kind of fiery, hungry uh, lawyers uh, that are not afraid and are not so politically kind of uh, uh, worked over that they are afraid of bringing very problematic and very dangerous cases like uh, uh, um, a, uh, um, a, that they say, if Mr. Kissinger ever dares go to Belgium, uh, I, I could, I could uh, issue an international arrest warrant against him for, uh, uh, for crimes against humanity. So uh, a Belgian juge d'instruction uh, got the Belgian government to go against uh, Senegal and say, Senegal, hey, you got that guy sitting there. Um, you are a member state of the UN Convention Against Torture. And if you look to get into that convention, you see there is an obligation in every member state to prosecute, um, to, to uh, just look into the matter. And if it, if it turns out that there is a, a uh, let's say there is really a, the, the question of criminal responsibility of a person, you either have to further prosecute that person, or if you don't want to prosecute, if you're not willing to prosecute, if you are not able to prosecute, to extradite that person to another country. And so Belgium said, if you don't do it yourself, uh, you are obliged to extradite Mr. Abre to, uh, to us. And that led to a long back and forth. And then Belgium went to the ICJ and said, listen, we are, article, we are Article 42 states and Article 48 states state at the same time. We are 40, Article 42 states, and I hope you understand what I mean by that. That is an injured state because, uh, because of some of our nationals, former Chad nationals, are there, and I have a claim on their, in, their, in their favor, for their favor. That would have been, the pursuance of that limb of a case would have been very problematic for Belgium because uh, it would have been diplomatic protection to be exercised by the ICJ, to be brought before the ICJ by Belgium. And in the law of, of diplomatic protection, there is a good old rule or bad old rule, which says that the, the breach of international law um, vis-a-vis a certain person, um, or at the time that that breach was committed, the person that you want to protect or does already has to be a national of you. And of course, these people had been Chadians when they suffered under Habre and had only become Belgium afterwards. So I think if Belgium had pursued that limb, it would have lost. But they said, we are also Article 48 states. We are a state other than an injured state. The UN Convention Against Torture is a typical embodiment of community interest. And every other state party to the uh, uh, to the uh, torture convention has a right to bring a claim. And the ICJ, if, and there you, we, we arrive at a, at a very important uh, other condition. So uh, if a dispute has arisen between you and the, uh, let's say between you, Belgium and the Senegal. So, because why, why is that so important? Because the, 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 the whole statute is built on the whole rules set of rules on contentious cases is built on the on the existence of a dispute there has to be an international dispute there have to be certain uh, attempts at settling the dispute peacefully but if that if that doesn't help you can bring a case before the icj um but you couldn't like what, what couldn't happen according to it before to in front of the icj is that if I sit there like I'm Austria and I sit there and suddenly I have some kind of a humanitarian, how should I say, impulse, beautiful blue sky, etc. And then you say, all right, now today I feel like taking uh, 
Ritania to the ICJ for human rights violations. Or you do it within a, a, a domestic election campaign, you want to be a great human rights lawyer to get votes, and you say, let's sue another country. That would not work. So, so that means the minimum condition there is there has to be a dispute. And a dispute consists on between the two states, the, the claimant and the, uh, the defendant, there had, to be, there had to be a development according to which the claimant asked, hey, you are violating the, uh, the torture convention, would you please? The other state says, no, I don't, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have a back and forth. And that has to be sufficient, sufficiently developed that the ICJ says, yes, indeed, this is enough to constitute the dispute. And in the Belgium Senegal case, this was said. Let me just mention that this necessity of a dispute as the basis for bringing an interstate case before the ICJ is a very interesting gadget because it allows, the, <laughs> I shouldn't, maybe I shouldn't say that, it, but I don't want to be cynical, but there are some, there are cases brought before the ICJ which are really not to the pleasure of the court, cases that the court really finds, I cannot, actually that might be a very negative example falling into the masterclass topic, even peace. This is just too much for a court. Um, we can do a lot of things, but if for instance, um, a country brings a, um, a case before me claiming that other countries have nuclear weapons in their positions, the treaty on nuclear weapons that they are all signed up says, well, fine, you can keep your nuclear weapons, but you have to seriously engage in disarmament talks because the ultimate aim is that everybody would get rid of its of nuclear weapons. And I claim that the disarmament talks have been all kinds of, uh, let's say, fake, uh, con uh, fake, uh, negotiations or some kind of fig leaf exercises, that would not be enough. The court could say, if a state brings a, and of course people will have, might have recognized that I'm talking about a, a case that happened in front of the ICJ a number of years ago, um, a case which a state from the Pacific state brought against 10 nuclear weapons, I think it was 10 nuclear weapon states, and it finally ended up with suing, I think it was India and Pakistan. I'm not, I'm not a great expert. And the court didn't want that case because it, a, a judgment would with certainty not have been implemented. That countries then get rid of their nuclear weapons or whatever. And so the court said, well, this Pacific state has a problem, but it's attempts to get these specific states that it wants to sue before the ICJ have not gone far enough to establish a dispute. And I am only there to settle disputes, but there isn't a dispute yet, you could say, and therefore the case doesn't go further. So that's, that's interesting because it is like, uh, how could you, I don't know how you call the, on a machine you have some kind of a, uh, maybe you could say adjusting, adjusting screw just to turn something down or to turn something out. And I think this notion that there has to be a dispute is some kind of an adjusting screw to keep away cases from the ICJ, which according to the court might damage its reputation or its authority. But in the Belgium Senegal case, this was this did not happen. So Belgium Senegal was a, a victory, the first application of, of, of this construction established by the ILC that you can go to the court without being injured against the violation, without being injured in your own rights or interests for the protection of obligations, ergo omnes or use Kogans. So that was a remarkable case until uh, recently, another case was brought, which is even more remarkable. And this is a case brought by the Gambia against Myanmar. Um, and uh, the, the, the current position of that case is that there has been at the beginning, I think in the, in, uh, at the uh, year, uh, there has been, a, has been a decision of the court um, deciding on provisional measures asked for by the Gambia. And the court is currently examining the question of uh, the uh, jurisdiction 
So it is, uh, it is uh, examining so-called, uh, uh, let's say, arguments by, uh, by Myanmar, which say, uh, which say that there, are, uh, there, there, there is law there which prevents you from going further. So that is where the case stands at the moment. So I'm talking about a case of Gambia versus Myanmar, where the Gambia claims that Myanmar is committing or has committed uh, genocide against the um, Rohingya ethnic group living in Myanmar, uh, which was subjected to all kinds of uh, massive human rights violations with the aim of, uh, I think the main aim was just to get these people to leave the country and flee to other countries like uh, neighboring uh, uh, the neighboring country. A, a, a case with a, a religious background, because the Rohingya are Muslims, whereas the main population of uh, Myanmar would be uh, Buddhists. What is precisely interesting, what, what is per particularly interesting about that case, why Gambia? Uh, so, and you could say in a way, Gambia was chosen to fight out that case against Myanmar, by an organization, the so-called Organization of Islamic uh, Countries, the OEC, um, as a country in a, in a, in a particularly good position uh, in human rights matters. And that had to do with a, with a change in the political system in Gambia. Gambia wasn't a particularly human rights friendly country until recently. One of the personalities that were instrumental in leading Gambia back to a human rights conforming system was the main figure in, um, let's say, we have to do something about uh, violations of our fellow Muslims in Myanmar. And, and, and that's why um, Gambia was chosen as the case suing. Why couldn't the OEC not sue itself? Well, because the statute of the ICJ does not allow, as I said, it's a very old statute. It does not allow suit claims by international organizations to go to the court. It's only states can sue other states before the ICJ. Uh, so this is Gambia, Myanmar. So what is, what is the difference to Belgium, Senegal? The difference I think is that the, let's say the, the relationship of the violation of human rights to the state that brings the claim is even more abstract. In the in, in case of Belgium with Senegal, you had this nationality, even though not terribly far leading element of, you had these Chadian nationals in Belgium getting this whole entire thing underway. In, in the case of the Gambia, you have no relationship whatsoever of that kind. The only relationship that you find is the relationship of a, of a common religion. So the, the state, other than an injured state that brings the case, still has a special connection uh, with the victims of that breach, namely a religious connection, which of course, for purposes of international law, is not really a, a decisive connection, but it just explains, because you could see, you see, what interest in the world could a state have to bring a case to the ICJ before another state? It's going to cost millions. What does it bring for yourself? Are you are you just kind of getting, uh, could say, kind of masochist or idealist or what? Uh, and then, if you look very closely, there you, you can see here why there is this OEC Muslim religion versus a uh, 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 country ruled by a Buddhist uh, group uh, is is visible. Okay, I think the time is running out. Let me just say a few days ago, a few days ago, maybe on 16 September of this year, just less than two weeks ago, a case was, uh, another case was brought before the ICJ that falls into this category, namely a case by, brought by Armenia versus Azerbaijan. So Armenia is suing Azerbaijan, and uh, this is uh, an, for, claiming that Azerbaijan in this conflict on Gorni Karabakh is has violated the UN Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, 
is the Racial Discrimination Convention, uh, by uh, killing um, people that Armenians, by driving the Armenians out of their home, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's a whole series of violations of the Third Convention, and there is even there is even a precedent to that that I haven't mentioned here, which was a case brought by Georgia in 2008 against uh, Russia. Uh, following the armed conflict that you had in Georgia in the summer of 2008. And Georgia claimed this was also a violation of the Racial Discrimination Convention. Third. So Armenia, this is a, another case. Um, a state engaged in a conflict with a, another state, a conflict which has even gone as far as becoming a military, a military conflict, uses the law uses international law, uses international human rights law, and uses the ICJ as what I call the Nebenkriegsschauplatz. That is, you have a, a, a much bigger problem, but to use whatever means uh, uh, lawfare. I think lawfare actually is the American term for this kind of thing, you know, that lawfare is used as a means of warfare. Uh, um, now, the, the Georgia v. Russia case didn't go very far because um, the court found in, uh, I think it was in 2010 or 2011, that uh, Georgia had not done uh, enough, had not attempted negotiations intensively enough, seriously enough with Russia, uh, which is a, which is a, uh, a condition of going to before you can go to the ICJ established in the third in the end uh, racial discrimination convention. And that's why if you read the application brought by Armenia just a few days ago, if you can read it on the website of the court, you see that they make a huge effort uh, depicting what kind of conversation and negotiation and attempts and letters and emails have been uh, gone on vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Azerbaijan, just to get over that, what I call the adjusting screw that the court might otherwise apply. Um, so this is, uh, that is, uh, Armenia would um, be a typical, what I could call 42 slash 48 state party to a case. That is, of course, being the victim of uh, armed activities of another state is a state injured in its own rights, but at the same time also claims, in, let's say, um, invoke rights that it has as a state other than an injured state, for the sake of its own, or for the sake of its own nationals. Uh, okay, so I'm very close to the end. Let me just say, all right. If you if you try to summarize all that, you can see you can say that the court whose attitude towards human rights was really developed gradually and uh, in ways that you, you couldn't describe as, hey, there you see a UN, a UN organ like the court really jumping at human rights possibilities. You know, we want to be very important here, et cetera, et cetera. No, no, nothing of that. Very gradual, making peace with human rights cases um, and uh, caution uh making place to a greater readiness but not in all of these cases the decisions were really cases which which would uh, bring about some kind of a jubilees by les droits de l'homiste and uh, one of these cases was already mentioned by valentina when she introduced me which was the case of germany versus italy against valentina's home country where the the uh well, maybe I, I just I, I, I just assume that at least some of you know about that case, so I don't have to go. To, so Germany claimed that Italian courts had gone too far in uh, in attempting to to pr to provide some kind of a compensation to Italian citizens that had been or their forebearers had been violated, even maybe even lost their life by activities of the German Wehrmacht and SS and Gestapo from 1943 up to 1945. So you had Corte di Cassazione, which is the Supreme Court in criminal and civil matters, uh, rendering judgments, which said, uh, of course, we recognize that usually these military activities uh, 
enjoy immunity because if you really want to find a good, impressive act, Jure Imperii, just look at the warship or an airplane. <laughs> this is Jure Imperii, you know, a, a model. But uh, certain acts Jure Imperii committed by armed forces do not, do not de deserve, just cannot have the protection of state immunity. And that is what we find with regard to these German cruelties. Mm -hmm. So Germany is uh, responsible and, we'll, uh, and, and uh, you, we, we can execute uh, you, you, the, the judgments brought in favor of Italian victims can be executed. And thus Villa Vigoni was kind of uh, selected as a beautiful target for such, uh, for such remedies. That's where, the, the that's where we had the conference of four years ago in Villa Vigoni, which is a, a German property in the middle of beautiful Italy. Um, and the court decided, it said, no, no, wait a minute. Um, we, are not, we, are not, we, we cannot really decide what the, what the Germans did in 1943 to 45 because, get to the start of my lecture, misery, um, because no jurisdiction is given about these matters. Uh, a complicated matter, but um, nobody can deny, nobody can say the court would have had the jurisdiction to go further. And so they said, what all we can deal with is we have to assess the activity of the Italian courts vis-a-vis -vis Germany up from the 1980s to the present. Cases in which these Italian courts said immunity does not, it does not uh, uh, apply here. And, and that the court found violations by Italy, i.e. Italian courts, i.e. Italy, that, uh, that it, Italy had to kind of uh, make good. Um, Maybe there are a couple of questions on this judgment. Right. Can I, why don't you let me finish then? And then we can go right into that question. Okay. Yeah, sure, sure. All right. Okay. So, because the point I want to make here, here is there is a number of judgments and uh, this is not the only case, like arrest warrant would be another case that we, where the court had to deal with human rights, but didn't just fall flat on its knees and said, if it's human rights, uh, I must let these rights win. The court said, no, no, wait a minute. If it, so it looks closely, it applies, let's say, regular, let's say, legal ways of establishing uh, like customary law, et cetera, et cetera, and decides also against human rights. That can also, that can also happen. And, um, well, this is going to be deepened in a second. So let me come to my conclusion. Can you call the court a driver of human rights? Mm. Well, you can certainly not see the court as some kind of a ersatz, ersatz world court of human rights, mm -hmm. uh, not even getting close. So what, what I see the court doing in essence is that the court is affects confirmation of human rights claims. It gives, uh, you could call it a stamp of approval or the ultimate blessing to claims of human rights, or it doesn't, right? But it, it, it can do that. Yeah. And in, in, in the papers that I wrote about, said I said, the court as, you could say, the guardian of the traditional international law mm -hmm. kind of uh, mainstreams is, is, is an instrument which mainstreams human rights. Mm -hmm. Because some of the claims by human rights treaty bodies, et cetera, simply for, if they are, if they are looked at in a, in, a, in a cool, detached, legal way simply don't make it to claims based on law and the court i think is an instance that you can call upon do, making this in an objective neutral sense um, of course the effects of human rights of these judgments you know that uh, judgments of the icj are only binding on the parties that's article 59 of the statute but when you look at the practice, you see that if the court has decided an important question of international law between st states M and P out there in the world, this judgment establishes a very high authority and, and is rested upon by states in their own conflicts. Is the ICJ a global actor for peace? Well, yeah, probably it, it does. Probably it qualifies, but in a, in a limited sense that you have to be that you have to carefully look at. And that gets me to the end of my um, 
presentation. I think I even stayed within the more or less just about prescribed time. And I see that Valentina is already boiling because she is probably no great fan of the ICJ uh, <laughs> uh, judgment. I, I, I no no no. This we can we can have another Vigoni conference. Uh, I think about, uh, but I think there are a few questions on that. So it's uh, of first of all, thank you very much, Bruno, for this wonderful journey through the glory and miseries of the ICJ, and uh, we really could see the incremental path uh, towards uh, uh, human rights considerations within the uh, ICJ jurisprudence and international role. Uh, we don't have so much time, so I would collect maybe a couple of questions and I will ask the uh, interveners maybe to be uh, brief. I would give immediately the floor to Caroline and Camille, and of course we invite also the audience to, uh, uh, to use the question and answer chat so that we can perhaps ask a few additional questions to uh, Justice Sinema. But don't, don't be, please be brief because Valentina has her uh, set of questions, which of course she wants to, <laughs> she wants to throw at me. Which, uh, please, Caroline, Camille, you have the floor, girls. Uh, good morning, Professor Sima. First of all, uh, I would like to say thank you because it is such an honor to have you participate in this year's uh, masterclass. And I personally find this conference really interesting. So my first question is, in fact, about immunities. You've mentioned the arrest warrant case. You've mentioned the Germany versus Italy and these cases. So I wanted to, to have your opinion on the future of immunities in international law. And do you think that immunity means impunity? And my second question is linked to the core of this masterclass. Uh, because you, you, you explain it very well, the International Court of Justice is an actor for peace. But since you were an arbitrator, I want to know if you think that other dispute settlement mechanisms, such as arbitration, are more um, entitled to bring peace between states. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline, for that question, which I could gladly lose fill a semester teaching about, but I try to do my best. Um, um, of course, the state actually in the arrest warrant case, um, let me just mention arrest warrant case was a case which was brought by uh, Congo against Belgium, because what had happened was that in the, in the con conflict of Congo with its neighboring states, uh, uh, the foreign minister of Congo had given a speech in which he had made uh, he had kind of used words, etc., which was regarded by a Belgium juge d'instruction as a as an incitation to uh, to genocide. I think or mass uh, because what he had said was chase them wherever you see them, etc., etc. Um, so Belgium and that was regarded by Congo as a breach or an intrusion into the immunity of uh, one of the most important state organs of the Congo. Uh, by that arrest warrant. Uh, and um, the court said, um, uh, the court brought out, uh, rendered the judgment and said, yes, indeed, there was a violation by Belgium because there exists this Im immunity. And, and, and in that regard, the state also, sorry, the ICJ says, but immunity does not mean impunity because there is a number of, uh, let's say, other avenues that can lead to the, the criminal responsibility being be, being uh, being really implemented against a person enjoying immunity under international law, like uh, the the person has uh, it does not uh, does not um, have the, the this position, which which comes together with immunity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so I think the the distinction here is really distinction between the jurisdictional immunity of a state as such and the jurisdictional immunity of an organ of a state, an agent of a state. Uh, and you can say, whereas in the, with regard to state immunity, the idea that there is some kind of a, there can be acts of a foreign, of a state which are to be regarded as criminal and should, and immunity should fall away and all kinds of, rights for other states would apply. This idea, which was more or less in the, 
in the world for a, uh, for a number, for a quite long time, there was this element of the Le Crime International, the international crime of states. But I think in the second reading of what we have on state responsibility, this concept was more or less, let's say, how should I say, a uh, uh, massacre that was done away with. And uh, because the idea that states can be criminal responsible, sovereign states, more or less, states living in what you call sovereign equality, that one state claiming that another state is criminally responsible is a thing which doesn't fit into that system. So I think um, with regard to that uh, criminal responsibility, it, doesn't have, it has no future in international. I think, when, when was it developed? Well, not, not surprisingly, after World War II, you had Nazi Germany, of course, la lying flat on the floor, and then you had the Russians and said, we are going to kind of take we are, we are really going to beat these people to a pulp. We are going to take away their industrial, etc. We are going to take away the eastern territory of Germany. And all that was done under the justification. Germany has committed crimes and now we are going to punish it. So in this situation, but this is not a, a good situation for a president. So, okay. But of course, with regard to state organs, the situation is very different. This is before the International Law Commission right now. It's also very, very controversial. But my view would be that uh, I would be in favor of a rule that uh, in, 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 in the presence of, let's say, uh, crimes against humanity, severe war crimes, or even genocidal acts, etc., cetera, uh, organs should, uh, there should not be any law protecting these organs against, let's say, um, prosecution by courts in other countries. So immunity does not imply imp impunity, even though under the law as it stands and under the law as it is claimed by more conservative countries like Russia, the United States even, or China, there is a gap here because immunity sometimes rem remains without impunity. Uh, is that more or less an answer to your question? So I think state immunity has a future. I mean, you know, I mean, <laughs> you could say it's it's made. What, what who makes the law on state immunity? It's uh, it's ministers of justice, ministers of foreign affairs, international organizations, people like me. I also have an immunity nowadays which, uh, against. Well, only the Netherlands, because the Iran-United States Tribunal is a bilateral institution. But in the Netherlands, I have the status of an ambassador. I've, well, I've never, I've never needed it, okay? okay. But it's great, isn't it? That, you know, you are just a, you know, Bruno Zima enjoys the state of an ambassador. Just look at some ambassadors, how full they are of themselves. So since the law is essentially made by these guys, you cannot expect them to really say, yeah, we get rid of everything and we just become normal people, you know, normal people. Thanks a lot, Bruno. Um, since we have a few questions, maybe we'll collect at least two people and right. I give the floor to Camille and then Mathilde. Good morning. Thank you for your intervention. It was very interesting. So uh, my question is, um, about the jurisprudence of the International Court of Justice. Um, in fact, after I read one of your articles, Mainstreaming Human Rights, the Contribution of the International Court of Justice, I thought that we can see, kind of see two faces regarding the court, of, uh, the court jurisprudence uh, related to human rights. One face is with a restraint concerning the engagement of the court in the human rights matters, and a second phase with a greater degree of readiness of human, right, human rights questions. So uh, I think I understood you say that uh, this change can be due to the inclusion of the judge from the rest. And uh, so my question is, since the beginning sorry, of- the Sorry, I didn't understand. You said, uh, I understood you saying that this development was what? Uh, was due to the inclusion of the judges from the Easter um, country. Well, and since the beginning of the week, we seem to have been told that human rights, as understood in France, are very Western human rights. And if this change is therefore a work of these judge, uh, judges, how can we explain the fact that this inclusion of human rights in the jurisprudence of the International Court of Justice is a consequence of their work? Thank you. 
All right. This is a very interesting question. Very, of course, very much to the point. But of course, uh, um, the question raises a problem. And uh, uh, because there is something like a convention uh, among judges of the ICJ and former judges of the ICJ, it's not a legal rule, but um, that you shouldn't really, uh, uh, let's say, tell anything about the the um, process of decision making, like saying, I remember that the judge from Mauritania was very much against, and and of course, looking at Italian judge ad hoc in the case against Germany, he said incredible things like blah, blah, blah. You're simply, you shouldn't, and I think I did not go that far. But of course, um, if, I, if I kind of translate my question, or it doesn't need translation to say, so can you say that the, the turn, the greater readiness towards human rights has to do with a, a growing influence of non-Western judges in the court, uh, I think uh, my answer would be, I cannot see that. Yeah. Um, and I, I, without getting personal, but I mean, with, I think I can say as much like with personalities like Rosalind Higgins mm -hmm. as the president of the ICJ, um, with the, in the, in the, uh, with the presence of judges or like uh, Burgenthal, for the United States, or maybe, well, some others, or including maybe a SEMA for Germany. I mean, what you had in the court was the composition changed. And I think you can see that most of the, let's say, not as many, many members which are influential, because of course you can distinguish between ICJ judges, some of them simply have less impact than others. Because they, you know, I mean, uh, the Hague is, uh, the Netherlands is a great place to play golf or, or, or some people almost never make it from Paris to the Hague because Paris is really to be preferred. Um, and others really sit and work. And um, I think you cannot say, no, I wouldn't go that far. I wouldn't say that third world judges, third world is, is that the obsolete expression now or let's that these judges do have an impact, etc. But to say that they really brought human rights to fruition in the jurisprudence, that I cannot say. Mm -hmm. um, you'd really have to go through the um, through the personalities, and you could say maybe there was a difference in the wall opinion. Some judges with an Arab background, or I'd say a Middle Eastern background developed an interest in the human rights of Palestinians, which was more or less a little greater than their interest in human rights of somebody in Southeast Asia or in Eastern Europe, simply because of human rights questions are always embedded in the political context. Mm -hmm. And when you say, who is ready to say something or be in favor of the human rights of Palestinians sitting in the occupied territories, you probably get yes, yes, by a number of people who didn't who didn't recognize before as great fighters for human rights. You see what I mean? But I cannot get more personal uh, that because that would be uh, against the convention. Um, let me just collect one from the common chat because it's a bit in the direction of what we said. But let's collect two because we have ten minutes. Maybe we can exceed a bit, and we still have four people at least. No, three people at least. So Lucille Marcou asks, um, "Good morning, sir, and thank you so much for your intervention. I was wondering which case of the ICJ you work on, and you think was the most important one for human rights? So it goes a bit in the direction of what you were mentioning about your personal contribution in this field." And then let me collect the one of uh, uh, Mathilde. Mathilde. Well, first, thank you for your intervention. It was really interesting. And my question will be, in your opinion, what can be the future of the court re regarding human rights? For instance, do you think that uh, human rights-based arguments in climate litigation may become the next phase in the engagement of the court with human rights matters? We know it is a hot topic today, especially with the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, who warns that the climate crisis is the main threat to human rights. 
And in light of the specific link between the United Nations and the ICJ, as you mentioned during your presentation. Thank you. Let me, let me answer the question maybe a bit uh, into a direction slightly different from what the, 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 the student had in mind. Uh, of course, for me, as a, as a human rights lawyer who didn't give up this interest, and of course, the Germany versus Italy case was a particularly problematic case. Um, and I think, Valentina, you might remember <laughs> the, the little, uh, uh, let's say, um, view I took in the, at the final round of that conference. Um, but I think the case there had to be jurisdiction for the case and questions that were very, let's say, decisive for the Italian case or for the human rights case simply did not fall under the jurisdiction of the court. And if you look at, and, and another question was, well, I mean, what is the basis for, can we, can we see in the world of customary law on state immunity, can we see a development which would justify the court saying, well, the, the law has changed and we are now in presence of a more modern customary law, which, which recognizes the exceptions that Corte di Cassazione did. And there, um, I really, I think it would have been impossible to say that uh, in, in, in good faith. Um, and I, at this point, I, I still say, when you look, if you look at the judgment, you see there, is a, there are two, let's say, paragraphs there which, which show the, uh, the, the feeling by the court. We had to decide that in case, in, in favor of Germany and against the Italian claims. But, and the first but is in a provision where the court says, I mean, we cannot, we cannot just but be, be but surprised. And what is it? Is this a matter of, uh, Valentina, you know that by heart. What did the court say? It's a matter of uh, surprise and regret. Regret, surprise, and, surprise regret. and regret. That this rich Germany, which kind of handed out money to everybody, all the victims, like in Eastern Europe, the Poles and Ukrainians, etc., that had become, uh, let's say, forced laborers, etc. Everybody got a little money. And the only group which was ex accepted were the military internees, um, civilian internees of, of, in Germany, 43 to 45. A group which now is, uh, I don't know, a few, probably a few thousand people still. Why? And they said it, is, it was a matter for the the, of surprise and regret for the court to see that. Now, just imagine the court renders a judgment. Judges don't, in judgment, usually express surprise and regret. And the ICJ says, Germany wins, but says, but we cannot just be also regret that this country did not just kind of say, all right, there might not be a legal obligation, but they are also going to get some compensation. And a few paragraphs later in the judgment, there is a saying that says, um, what we decided here is, of course, not to be in the way of negotiations between Germany and Italy about that question. Mm -hmm. I, remember, I remember, as I probably said in, on Lago di Como, I remember the afternoon in which we negotiated that. And it was a very hot, just a way of expressing, uh, so the, the court was not ready to say, so we invite Germany to negotiate with Italy about that. So when you read it, it just says, what we say here is not in the way or, or of, of doing that. That is a very, let's say, very, let's say, reduced, cautious way of expressing it. But the idea was, all right, you win the case, but just come on. And that shows the, the, the atmosphere behind. And you can, you can imagine that this atmosphere was particularly, uh, on, on my shoulders and on my head. So, of course, you had the genocide case, etc. But the, the one case in which I was personally most involved was the Germany versus Italy case, which was also the last case that 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 um, that I participated in. Um, future development. Um, um, I, I really think if you if you if you if you really 
just imagine a landscape of international law and there would be like a, a province and on that landscape would be human rights and then you make a big red dot on if a case hits there you could see there is indeed in recent years a, an accumulation and a multiplication of courts of, of cases mm -hmm. what i also find interesting is that in the gambia myanmar case uh, the netherlands and canada said uh, we are um, we are um, ex um, uh, it's, uh, we might join the gambia in that case so if you have a case brought by a state other than an interest state, then you have other countries saying we are going to join you so that the collective interest behind the Human Rights Treaty, the collective interest is not just taken up and put forward to The Hague by one country, we have groups of states assembling. And I think this is really um, a development which I find highly, which I would welcome very much. I just wonder, and, hope that this development will not fall a victim to what I see very recent developments in international human rights, where of course the West, in the language of your, um, loses a lot of uh, um, its moral justification to pursue these claims by its own behavior. So personally, if you ask me, and I said that openly at the conference in The Hague, I find the way in which uh, the European Union and its member states treat the refugees around the Mediterranean as violations of international law, simply as violations that people are put, put back at, the, let's say, driven away from the boundary. The um, elementary elements of the, the refugee convention are neglected, etc. And of course, if you find yourself in, in, in such a position, you better shut up uh, criticizing other, other, uh, other countries. So I hope that human rights remain the kind of impact and uh, power uh, in the UN in general. Thanks, Bruno. We have a very last question from Irini, and I think we can... What is it, your questions? Well... <laughs> We can I continue. Reply, <laughs> you reply to, to, to a few of them. All right. Probably my main concern with the, if we go back to the to, to our case, is the very formalistic approach that I see in the ICJ judgment. I mean, for me, this idea about the procedural aspects of immunity that doesn't arrive to the substantive part. I don't know. It's the part that morally bewilders me uh, the most. Because I think it's like, you know, hiding between the formalistic screen without really going to the core of the question. And it's four years that I'm reasoning with this judgment and I still don't know uh, what I think about it, what I think about the Italian Constitutional Court. But I think that in the ICJ judgment, the part that is most disturbing to me, it's the uh, formalistic approach. I would have preferred a more honest idea towards this. And this is why we need probably to preserve immunity. I mean, I, uh, Tom Ushat wrote so much about maybe in, in a way that I'm not fully, uh, you know, convinced about, but the part about immunity and preservation of peace is something that I, I still follow, right, to, to, to a certain extent and stability of international law and rule of law. But yes, this would be probably the part I would be happy to discuss with, with you. But if you allow me just to take also Irini, since we already passed our time. And uh, Irini, you want to, to ask yes. your question to Professor Sima? Yeah. Yes, good yeah. morning, Professor. I would also like to thank you for uh, your enlightening uh, intervention. And uh, my question is more linked to peace, since this is a topic of our masterclass. And um, actually, uh, during your presentation, you mentioned the case of Uganda and the DRC, in which the, the ICJ was very protective of human rights. But I think that what was very interesting in that case was that the ICJ um, described the peace agreement between uh, several states and also non-state actors that were involved in that case as a modus operandi and not as a legally binding uh, peace agreement. And my question would be, do you consider that peace agreements uh, signed between uh, states and non-state actors, which are not um, considered to be subjects of international law, um, do you, what, what is the legal status of these uh, peace agreements? And do you, if we, you consider that they should be legally binding 
or do you consider that they are uh, merely political, a political and maybe diplomatic uh, instrument? Thank you very much. I suspect that you might be working on a, on a, on a PhD or something on a topic. <laughs> uh, of course, I have to say that I, at the moment, I didn't even remember the, because this was a judgment, I think, rendered in 2005, right? Six? The I think it grant. was a little bit later. Well, Ten. Not no, 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 no. Which one? You mean Congo? Uh, yes, Uganda. Uh, the, oh, Uganda, the, the no, no. This was because I remember my babies. 2004, the Wall Opinion. 2005, Congo, Uganda. 2006, Congo, Rwanda. 2007, genocide. 2000. <laughs> but we can, unfortunately, we could have a little bet, you know. But <laughs> uh, so I don't remember actually that the court said. I would have to look into it and see why did the court not go further. Uh, but I think maybe a quick answer in a, in a broader context. The court has to be very, I think the court has to be very cautious in dealing with issues which are highly controversial, uh, like what precisely could be customary law or let's say mo very modern ways of establishing customary law but also the question of the legal position of non-state actors with regard of them because when you say that they they are subjects they are fully under the international law let's say the geneva law or the, the hague law what impact that would have on the rights of states to deal with these non-state actors at the like uh, and so the the court will probably I'll give you another example from that very case. Uh, for me, the question was, wasn't what happened the classic case of an aggression according to definition of aggression in resolution 3314 of the United Nations? Because if you look at, this is a definition of acts of aggression. And one of these, which say, and if that is the case, this is an aggression except if it's decided otherwise. But let's say really, Examples. And one of these examples was the case of a, the, you have on the territory of one country, you have armed forces of another country, and then that country says, now would you please leave? Thank you very much. These armed forces don't leave. And that was the situation in the Congo with regard mm -hmm. to Rwanda, Uganda, etc. So I remember I was fighting, you said, please, isn't that just the signature of an armed aggression? I remember. So members of the court who had, of course, diplomatic experience said, no, never, even, uh, well, no names. They said, no, we are not going to, we are not going to call that aggression because politically speaking, aggression, if you are accused of aggression, this is much heavier and much more destructive than saying you have violated the Article 2, para 4 of the UN Charter. And so for political reasons, the court sometimes doesn't call a spade a spade. And I think that was probably the reason behind treating agreements like the ones that you have in mind more fully. They say, let's keep away, let's not touch, this is too hot. So let's, let's try to get away around it and maybe calling it the modus vivendi, which of course had a certain impact, uh, was a way out. And let me just thank all the participants they, they, for having, uh, let's say, listened to me for such a long time. And I wish all of them lots of success and happiness uh, and peace in their lives and professions. Thank you very much.